final accounting section is the most sophisticated of all. It's called accrual accounting. And what we're going to cover in accrual accounting is what accruals and prepayments are. It's an even greater refinement on timing. We're going to talk briefly about journals. We're going to give you an illustration of how these things work on a computer system. We're going to talk about other assets and liabilities. We're going to talk about classifying assets and liabilities. And then we're going to get onto the balance sheet. So the accruals accounting principle. We start off with cash flow accounting, where we account for everything by reference to the date in which we made a payment. We then move to invoice accounting, where we account for everything in the month in which we the invoice is dated. Accruals accounting takes it one step further and it talks about accounting for sales and costs in the month in which they take place, even if the invoice date doesn't tally. So that might seem a bit strange, but it happens quite often that there'll be expenses where the invoice date does not represent the date in which the expense or sale actually took place. And we'll mention a couple of them, but it's the principle I want to identify. And I want to start off with accruals and start off with the most easy example, which is we're going to account for costs in the month of February. And we incur an expense in February and the invoice date will show a February date. So when we get the invoice, if we were doing invoice accounting, we'd account for the date correctly. But by the time we do the account at the end of February, we haven't yet received that invoice. So we've had an expense, but we haven't accounted for it using invoice accounting because we haven't had an invoice to record. It's also conceivable that the invoice date might say March, even though the expense was received in February. And that does happen much more commonly than you would expect. Um, if, for example, you've got rent and someone's charging you rent in arrears, very often the landlord would use an invoice date where the invoice date doesn't represent the month in which the rent was incurred, February, but rather the date on which you have to pay the bill, which is March. So the invoice date doesn't always tally with the date of the expense. And the same thing happens with income for different reasons. But accruals accounting says you account for things not in the month that you pay for things, not necessarily, not necessarily in the invoice date, but always in the month in which the sale or expense is actually incurred. And if it happens that payment is in the same month, then it turns out that cash accounting and accruals accounting will give you the same result. Or if the invoice happens to be the same date, then the same thing is true. Invoice accounting might give you the same um, result. But typically, accruals accounting will give you a different figure from either invoice accounting or cash accounting. And accruals accounting are the most sophisticated. It's the most reliable because you're identifying expenses whether or not you've received an invoice. And if you've paid for stuff, which doesn't relate to this accounting period, you're going to make the adjustment. So let's firstly talk about the accrual. Let's imagine you've received a telephone bill and the telephone company is charging you for costs you made in the month of February. But the date they're going to put on the invoice is March because that's the date that they're allowed to charge you. So that's a very typical scenario. And in that case, we get to the end of February, we have to know somehow that we've got telephone costs and that the telephone costs have not yet been charged to us. How you do that is a whole separate discussion, but let's say you've identified that there's a telephone cost that you haven't yet been billed for. You have to make an estimate. And let's say you estimate that the bill is gonna cost you 1200 pounds. 
You haven't yet had the bill that's going to come the middle of March, but you're doing accounts as at the end of February, and you're actually going to do them on the 1st of March, so you haven't yet had the invoice. So the way you deal with this is you're going to account for it as if you had received an invoice, but instead of putting the creditor to creditors, you certainly don't put it to bank because you haven't paid for it. Instead of that, you put it to something called accruals, where accruals is another type of creditor, um, which is akin to trade creditors, but where you ha yet, haven't yet had the invoice. So I'm just going to introduce you briefly to something called an, 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 a journal. And a journal is a pretty geeky accounting way which identifies how you move, uh, how, you, how you create debits, uh, how you create assets and liabilities if you don't have an invoice. So just to get started, the recommendation is don't understand journals, just accept them for what they are and emulate this journal. Whenever you're doing a journal, emulate this and try and imagine that you're accounting for it as if it was a bank payment, but instead of the payment going to the bank, it'll go to some type of creditor account. And if you're doing a prepayment, exactly the opposite happens. So in this case, there's a, a, a bank account, called, sorry, there's a balance sheet item called accruals, which is akin to trade creditors. And in this case, we're going to put the cost through to telephone. So we debit telephone 1,200 pounds, and we credit accruals 1,200 pounds. So I'm now going to show you how you do this in KPM. OK, so I'm going to go back to the quick entry in KPM. I'm going to imagine that that's 1,200 pounds need to be accrued, not in February, but in January. So I'm gonna put through a quick entry in January. I'm gonna treat it as a payment. I want it to go to telephone. So telephone, fax, and internet to the account. The description is accrual for Jan invoice, not yet received. And I probably put the name of the company say BT or whatever, whoever the name of the company is that was doing it. The invoice date, the date that you're going to enter here is the a date that relates to the month in which the accrual is relates. So I'm going to call it 31st of January. And the amount is 1,200 pounds, no VAT. If I was paying this with a bank, I would normally put bank. Um, oh. um, I would normally put bank. Wouldn't it be lovely if I was able to select here, not a bank account, but an accrual? So that instead of the amount going to the bank, it went to an accrual. In journal terms, when you enter a payment, if this goes to the bank, what you're saying to the system is, reduce the bank balance and there's a there's a concept uh, that, that a debit is an asset the easiest way to remember that is if you think of a debit as a debtor so you think of a debtor a debtor is an asset so that's the easiest way to remember that a debit is an asset that any asset is a debit and anything else is a credit that's the double entry so if we pay money out, we reduce the bank balance, we reduce an asset, we reduce a, de a debit, we credit an asset. So we credit bank, reduce bank, and we similarly reduce profits. And the other side of a credit to the bank is to debit profits. So the journal would be credit bank, debit profits, debit telephone in this case, the expense. But because we don't have an accrual, we would like, if we were able to select here an accrual, we could simply put in the accrual here, and that would automatically for us, put the journals through, that would automatically credit accruals, debit telephone. But unfortunately, we can't do that. 
So we're going to have to use a different section in KPM, which is the section for journals. And in this case, I'm going to put in journal. And the journal, the date of the journal will be the 31st of March. Sorry, week one, 31st of January, because I want this to relate to January. January. I'm going to call it January. January accruals. I'm going to demo my telephone. That's the category. My description is telephone accrual for January. And I might say BT. Um, no VT on this because I'm not that registered. I'm going to debit the 1200 pounds because my journal said debit it. So as I said, the suggestion to you is use the journal I gave you as a default, even if you don't understand it. And that's the template. And the, in this case, it was debit telephone. And then I'm going to add another row. And this time I'm going to credit accruals, accrued expenses. Um, the same um, description, telephone for January. And this time I'm going to credit the 1,200 pounds. So in my journal, my debits equal my credits. So I'm going to save this, save and close. And now if I look at the profit and loss account for January, let's go back to January. This time I've still got my sales from the last uh, module that we did of 1,000 pounds. This time I got the 1,200 um, pounds that my telephone cost. I've recorded the expense, even though I haven't paid for it. And even though I haven't received an invoice yet. So if I go back to the balance sheet now, and I'm gonna go back to the end of January, I've got my 1,000 pounds of trade debtors, Look, I've got my accruals in trade credits of 1,200 pounds. And if I take my debtors away, my accruals, my creditors or accruals away from my debtors, I've actually got a net loss of net negative assets of 2,000 pounds. When I get this money in of 1,000 pounds, that's not enough for me to cover my, um, uh, my creditor when that comes due. So I've got a net liability, which hopefully I can pay with an overdraft or maybe the owner will put some money in. And that represents my loss of 200 pounds as at the end of February, uh, end of January. Let's look at what happens now if I switch to the end of February. So I've got my cumulative figure. This includes both January and February. Let me go back to the profit and loss account. This time I've now got my telephone of 1200 pounds that wasn't there beforehand. Everything else is there exactly as it was beforehand. And now I've got a loss of 980 pounds because the small profit I had has been eliminated by my um, telephone. So my accrual has allowed me to account for this cost, even though I haven't yet had the invoice. So as we saw with trade creditors, now in the month of February, I'm gonna get my invoice. When I record the invoice in my purchases, that's gonna to appear to double count everything. So the way I manage this is I record the purchases when it comes in the BT purchases, which is hopefully is in February, but then I'm going to record another journal, which will do exactly the opposite of what my first journal did. So let me look at all the journals I've got so far. So I'm gonna, with this January journal, the journal said debit, telephone, credit accruals. In February, I'm gonna do exactly the opposite and I'm gonna reverse it. And that way, even though the invoice comes in from BT and on the face of it, I'll then have a second 1200 pounds go through to telephone. My journal, because it reverses the accrual, will also reverse the duplicate invoice in February, uh, the duplicate cost in February. So without dwelling on it, because I don't want to get too bogged down in journals. The reason I'm explaining this is I want you to, wanted you to understand the principle of accrual accounting, because once you've understood the principle, you can then look up how to do it in practice. 
I'm going to go back to the presentation. So we talked about accruals. Um, there's something that is exactly opposite of accruals. Again, this is where invo the invoice date does not represent the month in which an expense takes place. So invoice accounting is not gonna give us the correct position. And in this case, the invoice date happens before the expense rather than afterwards. So instead of accruing, we have something called a prepayment. And this is best illustrated with rent. If we pay six months of rent in January, that expense allows us to accommodation for all of each of January, February, March, April, May, June, each month. And the invoice date will probably show January because that's the correct date in which the invoice was raised. So if we were to do cash flow accounting and we pay the whole six months in January, we'll show a loss in January and our costs for February through to June will not be shown correctly. And exactly the same is true with invoice accounting. If the invoice is all dated January and we record it, and we record it according to the invoice date rather than the expense date. But in the case of rent, the expense actually occurs over the six month period when we get to the end of January, even though we've accounted for six months, we have paid for it or our invoice shows six months of payments, five of those six months are paid ahead of time. So at the end of January, what we want to do is to set up a journal that reduces our rent. It reduces our loss. We credit rent with 500 pounds. And we set up an asset for the fact we paid money ahead of time. We're going to get the benefit of it in future months. So it's an asset in that respect. So we debit prepayments. And this is what the journal looks like. Again, don't worry too much about what a journal is. Just use this as a template. That if you pay for something ahead of time, when you first record the rent payment, in the month of January, we show rent of 600 pounds, let's say, where we show the invoice in trade creditors and we credit credit to 600 pounds and we have 600 pounds debited to rent. This journal will say at the end of February, uh, at the end of January, we'll reduce that 600 pounds by 500 pounds, leaving just 100 pounds in the month of January and we'll set up a prepayment of 500 pounds at the end of January. And at the end of February, we can then do exactly the reverse by releasing another 100 pounds of that rent. So in the month of February, we would have an opposite entry here, which is debit rent 100, credit prepayment 100. And what that would do is that would put 100 pounds of the original 600 into February, and it will reduce the prepayment that was at the end of January of 500 pounds, reduce that to 400 pounds for the end of February. So this journal at the end of February um, is an additional journal. And, and each month you'll have another journal that will clear the prepayment. Again, I don't want to get too bogged down in it because this is an introductory module. But again, I want to illustrate the principle that what we're doing with prepayments is we're taking costs which we pay now but for which the benefit arises in the future so we shouldn't treat it as a profit and loss account item but we should treat it as something else and this is the essence even though prepayments relate to just expenses there's a whole section of accounting this other story that i was talking about right at the beginning we tell about accounting do we have enough money to run our business? Because although I've just illustrated a relatively trivial example, 
there's actually some very substantial examples of what happens when you pay money ahead of time and get the benefit in future. So payment is simply where you've got an expense that relates to a relatively short period of time forward. Um, and the idea of a prepayment is just to allow you to carry that forward month to month to month. But balance sheet accounting is where you have this, um, this make some purchases where the purchase relates not just to one or two months ahead, but sometimes years ahead. So these are balance sheet items where the invoice date and the payment date just do not represent the period in which the costs take place. And here's a number of assets and liabilities that when you're doing accounts, you need to treat differently from profit and loss account items because these relate to assets or liabilities rather than profit and loss account items. So again, I'm gonna come back to pretending that all of these relate to payments. We bought something or receipts, but of course, exactly the same applies when we have invoices. But imagine we bought some property Imagine our quick entry, we have, uh, we show say a hundred thousand pounds going out of our bank to buy property. We could show that as um, rent. Let's imagine that property is buying us premises for a 10 year period. We could show that hundred thousand pounds going to rent and our profits would be hugely wrong in the current month. And the reason for that is that what we're buying is not rent, but we're actually buying an asset. So we would have an account category, not of rent, not just of rent, but separately from profit, of profit, where the property relates to an asset, not to a profit and loss account item. So when we show that payment from the bank account, instead of showing it to rent or profit and loss account item, we show it going to property. So in the balance sheet, it would show instead of a loss of 100,000 pounds, it would show reduction in the bank of 100,000 pounds. Hopefully we've got money in the bank already to be able to cover it. At worst, it would be an overdraft of 100,000 pounds or a bank loan. Credit bank, debit property, we show an asset of 100,000 pounds. Or in our quick accounting or our invoice accounting, when we show that invoice coming in, the account classification would not be rent, but it would be property and our accounting system knows the property goes in the balance sheet. So I'm gonna go through a few other account categories, which is the same type of thing, where if you're gonna buy any of these items, you would need to set up a separate account category. And when you make the payment, or when you record the invoice, instead of recording it to profit and loss account, you, you would record it to these assets. So one of them is plants or machinery. So imagine you're a retailer and you're kitting out a shop and you're erecting um, um, a shelves so that when people come in, they can buy the stock. That shelving is part of your display, um, how you sell things. That'll last for a year or two. That's called plant and machinery. It's part of the... It's part of your fixed assets, it's part of your long-term assets. You've paid money out for it. You need to release that cost over a one, two, three year period using something called depreciation. Uh, but the key point is at the point at which you pay the money or you spend that money out, even though it goes out in that month and even though you receive the goods, uh, the shelving in that month, the benefit to the business the expense take place over a one, two, three, five, 10, 20 year period. And your accounts need to reflect that. So coming back down to earth, if you're buying shelving, when you're either entering your creditor, your invoice, or you're entering the payment, the classification you would put to it would not be a profit and loss account item, it would be plant and machinery. So other items you might be buying, which are, Assets might be vehicles, motor vehicles, um, tractors if you're a farm, um, lorries if you're a, a distribution company. You might be buying stock. Stock's a much shorter term asset, 
but stock typically is an item you buy, which you're going to sell in one, two, three months time. Let's say you're selling um, sweaters. You would buy a bunch of sweaters in say January and you sell them in February or March. So rather than treating them as purchases in the month in which you buy them, even though you receive them, you treat them as stock. So that would go into stock, which is a balance sheet item, wouldn't hit your profit and loss account, providing you remembered that the month in which you sell that stock, you move it out of stock and into purchases. That's the, the key bit that you'd have to remember for that. And a couple of other assets which just appear naturally, and we've already talked about them, is debtors, prepayments and bank. Those would naturally occur with what we've already talked about. And the counter side to that is liabilities. We've talked about creditors, we've talked about accruals, and a couple of other liabilities we may need to keep track of is one is taxes. So it could be that we need to account for tax. Our next module talks about taxes, but it could be that we need to create a liability so that when we're identifying our profits, we make a provision for the tax we're gonna to have to pay against those profits. So we don't spend money that we're gonna to have to pay in taxes. So we may decide to make a provision for tax. That's a liability. If our owners put money into the business, let's say the owner puts in 20,000 pounds to our bank account, that money is owed back to the owner. So the asset, the, the bank is increased by 20,000 pounds. We debit bank and what we credit is a owner's funding. Now, if they put in share capital, that's treated in a slightly different way, even though it's the same principle. Ultimately, share capital is owed back to the owner, although you've got to close down a business to do so. But the principle is you could have a liability to an owner. Bank overdraft, the same thing. Bank overdraft just may happen by default from your cash book. But a loan, you maybe you actually take out a formal loan from a bank. They'll transfer money from the loan into the bank account. And again, the entry might be debit bank, credit bank loans. And it could be other people give you loans as well. It doesn't have to be an owner. Same principles apply. What you're identifying with a balance sheet is when you account for things in your cash book and or your invoicing, if the categories relate to a profit and loss account item, you'll account, we've already talked about that, but if you're accounting for a balance sheet item, you'll put it to a different place. And this is what the accounting system will do for you. It will accumulate together all the assets that you've bought, all the stocks, set that off against your bank and your creditors, and that will give you your net assets. And if you've done everything correctly, the other side of the net assets, if, you, if you've added to your assets, the other side is you've added to your profits. And as it happens, the net assets might be a combination of either all profits or profits plus share capital. So that's the balance sheet. And I'm quickly going to show you the, a spreadsheet to show you the categories I want to show you some balance sheet categories. And again, if you're not sure, when you're setting up your accounting system, what categories to use, this is a very typical balance sheet. So these are the categories you'd set up so that when you're doing your accounting, you can uh, allocate uh, a, a, an item of expense, not just to the profit and loss account, but also to a balance sheet if you want. And one is plant and machinery, one is vehicles, I've called it cars, stock debts prepayments bank and you can see the others this is a typical balance sheet and if you set up categories um, these categories that's a very good start point and if it turns out you need additional categories it'll be very easy for you to add them in as well what we've now covered is accruals accounting so we've switched back We've talked about uh, cash flow accounting. We've talked about invoice accounting. And now if you want to get more sophisticated, we've talked about accruals accounting. Um, accruals accounting are quite sophisticated. If you're doing your own books, it's almost certain you're gonna involve your accountants in accruals accounting. 
But the reason I wanted to go through this with you with the introductory section is that you have a feel or an understanding of what it is that you're doing so that when you start to operate it, it makes a lot more sense to you. The context in which accounting is carried out is that businesses have laws that both protect the business and define certain obligations. Part of those relate to contracts and part of those relate to taxes. And I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the legal context. I want to talk about legal entities to explain, to distinguish you from your business. I want to talk briefly about contracts. I'm gonna to touch briefly on sales taxes, trading taxes and payroll taxes. And I'm not looking to tell you all about those taxes. I'm simply looking to tell you enough that you can understand how that fits in with your, within your accounts. So the first context I wanted to identify is a legal entity. A person is a legal entity. It's all very simple and very obvious. But what happens if you're self-employed and you have a business are you the same as your business? Well, funnily enough, not necessarily is the answer. Um, if you're a limited company, the limited company, if you trade through a limited company, the limited company is defined as a different legal entity from you. So when you enter a contract, it's a different entity from you. Um, if you're in a partnership with somebody else, for example, the partnership comprises you and someone else, or at least one other person, maybe plenty more people. But again, the partnership can enter a contract as if it's a single person in its own right. And although if you're self-employed, you and your business are not technically separate, separate, in all respects, you'll be much better off if you pretend that your business is a different entity from you. So in law, you might not be different, but if you treat it as if you are, you're gonna find a lot of benefits come from it. And the first and most obvious point is, if you're a self-employed person, set up a separate bank account that relates just to your business, even though the business is the same as you. And the reason for that is you want to distinguish your business activities from your personal activities. And if you mix them together in the same bank account, it becomes really difficult to do. But if you put all your business transactions through the business and none of your personal stuff through the business, you'll find it much easier to account for the business. And of course, if you ever want to take money out of the business, you can always simply write a check to yourself as if it was a salary and you call it drawings. But again, you're distinguishing you from your business. So I want to talk briefly about contracts. A contract is an agreement to deliver goods or services in exchange for payments. An agreement to deliver goods or services in exchange for payments. And it's a legal agreement, which is enforceable in law. So technically, you can agree, have a legal contract just by saying to someone, I agree to shake your hand. And if I shake it in a certain way, you'll pay me five pounds. Maybe to take a selfie with me. If you're a celebrity, you might want to charge for, for something really simple and trivial. And technically, any agreement is a contract. The problem is, if you have an oral agreement, it's very difficult to prove what you were agreeing. So typically, if you're in business, all contracts you should put in writing and if it's an oral agreement, it's very difficult to enforce. You can almost imagine there's no real agreement. It could be you've got documents that evidence the oral agreement. It might be, for example, you agree something and confirm it by email. Well, in that respect, you're writing down some of the terms. So you can have an oral agreement, but generally let's assume that everything, if you're running your business properly, you'll create a written agreement and that written agreement will have two sides to it. One side will be your obligation to deliver something, and that's to the supplier, 
side of the contract, and the other is to pay for it, and that's usually for the customer. That's the essence of almost all contracts. And typically, a contract requires you to deliver goods or services, which you then invoice, and which are then paid for. So the contracts can be dated in a particular month. Delivery can take place in that month or another month. Pay, the invoice can be dated in another month and the payment can be in yet another month. Now, of course, they can all take place in the same month. And you can have one contract that governs lots of deliveries going months and months and months into the future or years even. But uh, the key point of a contract is the date you sign a contract is not important for accounting purposes. What's important for accounting purposes is the date you deliver goods or services. But sometimes the contract will help you identify what, is, what are the goods and services you're delivering, which help you identify the date it is delivered. So usually the contract doesn't have much bearing on the date of accounting, but it's useful to know, um, it's useful to know not least because if a contract identifies an obligation, that's a useful start point for accounting for stuff if you don't have an invoice. Do you remember when we were talking about accruals, we didn't have the telephone bill. If we got the contract, that might identify that we've got a liability, that we've, got, we've received a good or service, even if we haven't had the invoice. So the key point of the contracts is that it's the delivery, that's the important point, but remember to identify all the obligations in a contract to make sure we account for all of those obligations correctly, whether it's the delivery of goods or services or the receipts or payments for them. Okay, that's the legal context. And ultimately remember that as long as you've got a properly documented contract, if either side doesn't comply with the contract, you've got the whole force of the law to enforce that contract for you. And it might be you get a court ordering specific performance or, or particular actions to be take place, such as make a payment if there's a dispute. And if that's the payment is not made, you can get bailiffs to go in. And if that doesn't work, you can charge people criminally. You can potentially get them jailed. There's a lot of um, penalties that you can employ. These are all state sanctioned penalties for enforcing a contract. It's a legal context within which you operate. This is why contracts are important. And this is why the context within which a contract, within which a business operates, is to recognize that it's a legal context. And sometimes you need to go back to the contract to define what it is you're accounting for. So part of the legal system is tax. Government needs to raise tax. Taxes are implemented by law. So I'm gonna deal with three taxes. Sales tax, trading tax, and payroll tax. Sales tax we've already touched on in the previous module, but the essence of a sales tax is that when you sell goods, you charge the customer tax and you have to pay the tax to the government. So straight away, if you're a, a retailer, sorry, if you're a trader, if you're in business and you're selling anything for which you have to charge sales tax, where that sales tax needs to be paid to the government, then you need to split out the sales between the sales that belong to you, that go to the profit and loss account, and the sales belong to the government that become a liability until you've paid that money to the government. In the UK, we've got a, a special type of sales tax, which is called value added tax. So although when you sell to the end customer, it works like any other sales tax, if you're a tra VAT registered trader, when you buy goods that have got VAT in them, the VAT on what you've bought, you can reclaim from the government. So even though you collect 30 pounds from the end consumer, if you pay 20 pounds to your supplier, you only have to pay 10 pounds to the government. 
the supplier will have paid £20 earlier in the chain. So the government still gets the £30, but you only have to pay £10, which is the difference between the VAT on your sales and the VAT on your purchases. So your accounting system will handle that. But I wanted to identify that if you're involved in sales tax and you have to pay the sales tax to the government, remember to separate out the sale. And if you're a VAT trader in the EU or the UK, where you're on a value added system, then you've also got implications for purchases because you can recover some of the VAT to reduce the amount you owe to the government. So that's sales tax. Trading tax typically works in the form of income tax or corporation tax. The calculation tends to be a bit complicated. You typically calculate your profits, in this case, 10,000 pounds. You'll find certain items that a lot of tax laws won't allow you to charge. In the UK, for example, you're not allowed to charge entertainments. So even though it's a valid expense, you just can't reduce your tax, can't claim it against tax. So you have to add it back. Um, legal fees, not all legal fees are allowable. So if you're buying property, you can set those legal costs against capital gains, but you can't set those costs against your trading profits because it relates to property, which is not a trading item. So you add back disallowable items. In certain laws, certain cases, there's other deemed income. So sometimes if, you're, if you've got certain types of loans to people, whether it's interest-free, um, the law sometimes um, deems that you've charged them interest. So you have to pay additional tax. So you then calculate the amount of profit that are chargeable to tax. There are then ranging from very simple to very complicated formulae for calculating taxes. It might just be a fixed 25% corporation tax, or if it's an income tax rate, you might have the first tranche, which is tax at zero, is tax free. You've then got another tranche at one rate of tax and another tranche at another rate of tax. So in this case, you've got your 12 and a half thousand pounds. The first thousand pounds is tax free. Next 2000 charged at 15%, the balance at 25%. That all comes to a total charge of 2,600 pounds. Once you've calculated the tax, that becomes due to the government. If you're accounting for this on a monthly basis, and it's not, most people don't, but if you're doing so, you'll calculate your, your, what you estimate the tax will be, and you'll account for the liability on an accruals basis each month. So each case you would debit profit and loss account, debit tax charge of 2,600 pounds, credit government liability or accruals, 2,600 pounds, and each month you'd increase that until you finally get to pay the tax bill, in which case you'd wipe out the accrual or the liability to the government. And if you've over or under accrued, the balance would go through to your profit and loss account. So the key part of this is calculate your profits and then set up a liability to make sure you don't forget to put aside money for tax because it's a liability which ultimately will be due. So the tax journal for what it's worth in this case is debit tax charge, credit tax liability. Payroll taxes are a bit more complicated because the way payroll taxes work in most countries is you deduct certain taxes before you pay your employee. Plus in addition to that, there's taxes on the employer. So in the UK, the payroll works. If you pay someone, for example, 2000 pounds, the government tax the employee 300 pounds of tax plus 100 pounds of national insurance. And if you had a traditional tax system, you would pay the £2,000 to your employee. The end of the tax year, the government would say, you've received £2,000, you owe us two, £300 of income tax, another £100 of employees' national insurance, you need to pay us £400. That's how a traditional system would work. But the way most payroll systems work is the government say to the employer, we don't want to do this, we don't really trust the employee. Instead, I want you to pay them net of tax. You don't pay them £2,000, you calculate how much tax they need to pay, and you pay them net of tax. You pay them £1,600. 
you pay the 400 pounds that you would have paid to them to us instead. But in addition to that, we're gonna tax the company another 180 pounds just for the privilege of employing someone. In addition to the taxes you deducted from them, you need to pay us the amount that you owe yourself, in this case, 180 pounds. So this is the way the accounting for it works. When you write a check, you write two checks or two bank transfers. One would be to the employee for 1600 pounds. And the entry for that would be when you account for the payment, it would be allocated to payroll. But at this stage, you haven't accounted for the whole of the cost. You've only accounted for the net pay you paid to the employee. Then you pay the 580 pounds to the government. Remember that's 400 pounds that you deducted from the employee plus another 180 pounds you owe to them. And when you pay to the government, again, you would show the money going out of the bank and you'd allocate that to payroll costs. So your total payroll costs that you've allocated are both the 1600 pounds that you, when you paid the employee plus the 580 pounds when you paid the um, government. When you add that together, the total of that is 2,180 pounds. So just by accounting for the two payments, the employee and the taxes, you've accounted for the payroll correctly. And just out of interest, that represents the 2,000 pounds, which is the amount you're paying to your employee, plus the 180 pounds that you owe for the employer's national insurance. So again, all I wanted to hi highlight with this is that when you're accounting for the payroll, typically it's in two or more checks. But as long as you put the classification all to the same place, you're going to end up with the correct accounting, even though it's a bit of a mind bend to how you achieve that. So the journal in this would be two separate journals. If you were entering by journal, you probably wouldn't if you're entering it as a cash entry, but uh, it would be debit, payroll, credit, bank. And then the second check, debit, payroll, credit, taxes which would be a liability to the government. But then when you actually pay it, you then pay the government and clear the liability.